welcome everyone to our second uh, edition of monthly uh, talks with jazz photographers. I'm Rai Retarian. I'm a member of the Jazz Journalist Association and I'm an amateur photographer, although not music specifically. Um, and uh, today uh, we will talk to Lauren Deutsch, who has a, a very unique body of work um and uh, welcome everyone uh so um laura and i we had talked before about the the unique style of photography you have a, in part of your work and how for me it was a very uh uh evocative of the the music of chicago particularly the creative music of the aacm um, will you tell us a little bit how you stumbled on this technique and, uh, and then we'll share some photos at near the end of the conversation. Yeah, sure. Um, I guess first I want to point out that I started out as we all did, um, as a so-called conventional photographer, um, and began shooting music in the late seventies. And as I went through the process of discovering what shooting music means, all of those things that you learn about um, anticipating gestures and lighting or um, the spaces of silence in the music, all things I, you know, began to sort of hone my eye to be able to look at and capture. Um, I felt more and more like I was, um, collaborating with the musicians that I was photographing on stage. And I felt um, a strong interest in trying to create visual equivalence to what I was hearing. You know, so after many, many years of doing sort of straightforward documentary photography, I began to experiment with movement. And um, initially, when I was still working in film, um, I just sort of experimented with moving my camera and seeing what would happen. Um, and those led to uh, thinking about other ways that I could sort of represent the music um, in ways that I could feel that other people could um, have the same sort of experience of the, the bigness of the music and the way it resonates in your bones. And I kept sort of uh, looking at different ways of being able to do that. I didn't have uh, big and larger, so I sort of started experimenting with making mosaics of smaller um, pieces of paper and creating collages, um, starting to think more in terms of uh, vocabulary that um, could include lots of different elements. And then in about the year 2002 or three, I guess, I reluctantly uh, moved into the digital world. Um, and I specifically, the moment and the place that it happened was in Poland. I was um, in my uh, career as executive director of the Jazz Institute of Chicago. Um, I fell into produce, co producing a festival in Poznan, Poland. And I had just bought a digital camera and I um, took it into a club to you know, put it through its paces. <laughs> and what I saw through the digital viewfinder was that um, the, when the musician moved, the light um, would create these trails, um, which I could see in the digital viewfinder. I had no idea at first if that was something that was possible to capture with this sort of a camera, but it turns out that, um, yes, it was. And so I found a new path into creating work that I felt could really represent visually the energy and the power 
and the creativity of the music itself. And so this is a good example. It's a picture of Roscoe Mitchell, who along with Nicole Mitchell, both of them became muses in a way, um, because every time I would photograph them in this way, uh, the magic would happen. Um, I began to sort of experiment with thinking about how and if musicians have specific light signatures um, in, in terms of would um, somebody else's saxophone have the same sort of light and movement that Roscoe did. Um, it's not so individual as it turns out. This is an example of um, Nicole Mitchell. It, in, in a lot of ways, it hardly looks like Nicole, but it was um, Nicole indeed. And this, um, these flute trails that happen whenever I photograph her are among the most um, sort of exciting um, things for me to see. Uh, I have worked now in a couple of different ways over the last 20 years or so within this medium. And um, some of the pictures that we'll look at today are really the pictures that just came out of the camera like that. Like the first one that Ryer showed of Roscoe Mitchell, that was me um, staying still and letting Roscoe's movement um, make the picture. Um, other times I will actually move my camera um, as long with the musician who I'm photographing who may be moving as well. And um, when I do that, I have a couple of different approaches to doing that as well. Um, sometimes, as I said, I let the musician do the moving. Sometimes I will move my camera in um, concert with the music, meaning I am moving my body and therefore the camera as I'm feeling the music moving me. And those are actually really the ones that I feel are the most successful in representing what the music feels like. Um, both Roscoe and Nicole have said to me um, pretty early on in my working my way through discovering how to use this medium, um, both of them said to me that um, what I was showing them was what they see in their head when they're playing. And so that gave me uh, a lot of encouragement to sort of continue on this path. And it has uh, developed in a number of different ways. Ryer, do we want to, um, I don't know if we're just going to move into looking at other images. Um, or if you had other questions. Yeah, no, we don't have to. I was just showing examples of mm -hmm. uh, what you were talking about so people can, mm -hmm. can visualize it. No, so we can go over the individual photos and talk about them later. Okay. So, um, uh, and you mentioned before that you, you also started off as a conventional photographer, as a documentary style and, um, how did that start earlier in your career? Um, how did it start? I think after I got bitten by the bug of this music, it inspired me as a young photographer in my 20s to begin to um, show up at the myriad events and music venues that were happening around town. And, and you pointed out early that um, in particular, a lot of my work represents the music of the ACM. And I think it's, and that is in fact, the form of the music that I was most deeply attracted to. And, um, and so, the, it, so I had uh, people in my life um, who were happy to introduce me to um, all of the other different aspects of the music. Uh, Howard Mandel opened a lot of doors for me. I began to build relationships with uh, venue owners like Joe Siegel's famous jazz showcase. And Joe was very um, 
welcoming to me as a photographer and invited me to have access to the showcase whenever I, I wanted to. And so I was able to kind of, um, you know, pay my dues and work up uh, to having the kind of um, experience and access to this music and seeing it through my camera. The interesting thing that happened, um, maybe, I guess, about uh, 15 years after I started um, uh, photographing music, I um, had served on the board of the Jazz Institute of Chicago for uh, about 14 years and, um, and, and stepped up to become its executive director um, in 1996. And so I started out as a photographer building relationships with the musicians, um, you know, who were also very welcoming at, to me when they would see me coming to photograph their sets. And when I became executive director of the Jazz Institute of Chicago, I began to produce events, which I was also able to photograph. Um, and I think in, you know, Adriana la at the last talk talked a lot about how um, the importance of building relationships with the musicians. And because that those become reflected in the images that you're making. Um, at least that's my sense that um, my particular approach was I think um, welcomed and appreciated by the musicians I was photographing because they they knew me and they and they knew me as an artist and as one of them. Um, so that's kind of how I started out, and then eventually, as I said, I crossed the digital divide um, in my effort to really begin to pursue creating these works that would reflect as Roscoe and Nicole said, what the musicians actually see in their minds when they're playing. Well, in that way, um, you become a sort of a silent member of the improvising group. Yes, that's what you and I talked about that yeah. a little bit. And um, I, I feel strongly that that is the role that I'm playing that I finally found a way to be on the music stand without being a musician. Yeah. Um, just uh, for uh, those who may not know what the AACM stands for, it's the Association for the Advanced of Creative Musicians. It was established here in Chicago in 1965 by uh, uh, Anthony Braxton, Henry Treadgill, the Art Ensemble of Chicago, Etc. So, just wanted to give that clarification first. And um, you've also done some mixed your background in film and photography into doing more moving pictures, dynamic photos. That happened a couple of years ago when a friend turned me on to an animation app, um, and it was really exciting to me because it seemed that I kind of the next step in the way I was envisioning this music was um, to actually see if I could um, make it move. And so the idea of animating my photographs was um, really exciting. And I've been doing that for a couple of years, trying to sort of get myself to the next level and understanding what all the possibilities are there. And, you know, so like music, which all musicians will tell you is infinite. Um, it's kind of, it's an infinite landscape to explore. And I feel the same way about photography is, um, it's really unlimited, especially now in the age of digital. Maybe we can uh, pull up photos one by one and talk about them. We can start uh, not necessarily um, uh, chronologically, but uh, starting with the uh, Roscoe Mitchell, which I first saw at the museum, uh, the uh, Contemporary Art Museum. Let me share my screen. 
Right, they were having a big exhibition um, to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the AACM. And no, it's not that one, though. Oh. Uh, I don't think I have another. It was, was it on your website? Oh, maybe. It's okay. We can we can go on. Okay. So this was. Where was this taken? Um. Good question. I believe it was at Constellation. Mm -hmm. um, and anybody who has watched Roscoe play has seen him swoop up and down with the horn, which affects the sound that you're hearing. And you can clearly see it affects the visual that you're seeing. Um, it's funny, the one that I thought, the one that was actually at the exhibit at the Museum of Contemporary Art um, was a, an experiment in reflecting, I, I will write, I can't pull it up because you have the host abilities. Um, Are you, can you send it to me? I can pull it up. Yeah, maybe. Um, Okay. Thank you for everybody's patience. I am uh, made you co-host if you prefer. Oh, okay. Or if uh, you want to email it to me, that's fine. I can pull it. Okay, up. I just found it, so I'm going to send it to you. Okay. Uh, Okay, as Ryer's looking for the email that I just sent, um, yes, okay. Thank you, Mark. That's a good comment. Photographs are made, not taken. Um, I started talking to some members of the AACM who would um, share with me some of the ways in which they think about um, how they manipulate the music, um, literally manipulating it um, in various directions and mirroring uh, music sequences or reversing them um, and experimenting with uh, putting them into different sorts of organic shapes. There's a lot of different ways um, I learned sort of a little bit about the inside of how the music is created. And the image that is of Roscoe that was part of the AACM's uh, anniversary exhibition at the Museum of Contemporary Art was a picture um, of Roscoe in which I was experimenting with working with symmetry, with changing, uh, with mirroring, with, um, you know, sort of looking at how the different rhythms um, of the music could be manipulated in the ways that the AACM folks talked to me. 
Um, so this was my first experiment in doing that. And um, it, for the, if somebody goes to your website, the, uh, the, the first picture is the one I showed earlier of Nicole Mitchell, which I will pull again. Um, okay. So. So. A friend, uh, my friend that I co-produced the festival in Poland with, um, he came up with a term, he came up with a name for uh, what I was doing here, which he called digi painting. So these are digi paintings, um, these uh, images that come out of the camera in just this form. You might wonder why there's so much movement in the entire frame of the picture except for Nicole's face. Um, that's because I've two things I've learned if I um, hold the camera still for a brief period of time and then move my camera, um, I can get a, a still face and still a lot of movement. But I actually um, cheated on this one and I uh, overlaid a, a straight photo on this image to give a greater clarity to her face. And so that's a technique that I've begun to use more and develop more. And I think that it creates a more interesting dynamism because it makes it a little bit less abstract and a little bit more mysterious. Okay, and uh, this is this photo of Max Roach done in the same way? Yes, so over this last couple of years when I've not really been able to get out to shoot very much, I have begun to rely more and more on my own archives. And there's two aspects to that. One is that um, over, I don't know, I guess the last 15, 20 years, I've been collecting what I call sound palettes. And those are images that I'm deliberately making that are abstract representations of sound, just like it sounds like a sound palette. Um, and I've begun to, um, make more montages using the various uh, sound palettes that I have as backgrounds. And in this case, going into my archives from the late 70s, um, this is a photo of Max Roach from the Chicago Jazz Festival, actually probably about 1980. And so realizing um, that while I haven't been able to actually be on the scene making my art, I have um, in fact such a deep archive both of conventional photographs and of my current interest in uh, visualizing sound. And so now I am um, creating these sorts of works that combine the two. Um, you also have the series uh, of photographs of Japanese uh, music. And this is one of them, of percussion. Yeah, my if you go to my website, there's a section called Spirit of the Drum. And um, this is a group of uh, Chicago taiko drummers who have a big performance at the Museum of Contemporary Art every year called Taiko Legacy. And um, they have become uh, another uh, muse for me in that when I photograph them using this movement technique, this sort of thing happens where they're, where it feels like to me, I'm actually photographing their spirits rising from the drum. Um, I, I have to say, and uh, any photographer on the call would understand that um, you, you are 
limited to what you're given in terms of light, wherever you are photographing. Sometimes um, it, the light is really less than adequate. And so you need to figure out what you have to do short of using flash um, to make images work. And in other places, the lighting is wonderful. And the Museum of Contemporary Art small stage is one of the places where I have found I've been able to really work well with um, the light there. And so, you know, of course, I feel that there's some sort of magic and maybe even spiritual thing happening when I'm able to make images like this. But, you know, the reality is, is it's really dependent on um, the guy who's putting the light on the stage. Mm -hmm. It, so is this indoors yes, or it's on indoor. the terrace? Oh, it's, indoors. it's indoors. Yeah, it's indoors on the on the stage in the auditorium. Mm -hmm. And uh, this uh, this one of uh, bassist Tatsu Aoki, he's playing uh, another traditional instrument. Is it from the same? Yes, he's playing the shamisen. And this also was at the Museum of Contemporary Art. Um, I think the interesting, so the, there's no shiny instrument to, for the light to bounce off of. And that's also what makes uh, shooting the Tycho Legacy uh, performances really interesting to me is that um, it doesn't, it seems like I'm, I'm not really needing to have that. Um, when I shoot the drummers, there's something else that's happening. I think, and the other thing I wanted to remember to mention was that my in my entire career of shooting the music, I've really only ever done performance. Um, I'm not a studio photographer. I'm not a um, photographer that sets up a picture. Um, I am really responding in the moment. And that's kind of the thing that has kept me going is this idea that I'm really improvising with the light, I'm improvising with my camera as a tool, I'm improvising with the music. And anybody who's, what are the small lines? I don't know, Mark. Um, they're, I can't really identify what or where the, any aspect of the image is coming from. <laughs> That's the magic part. So before we uh, show the the more moving pictures, I would like to pull up some of your earlier doc, uh, more documentary style photos and talk about that, starting with this with John Faddis. And is that Victor Garcia? Yeah, um, what I love about this picture is, and because um, I, you know, have been living this double life of being a presenter and producer of the music as well as uh, photographing it. In fact, at the jazz festival, I would often uh, introduce a band on stage uh, or be talking about um, other aspects of what the Jazz Institute was doing, and then I would uh, go down into the pit to photograph the music that I had just introduced. In this case, this was a centennial uh, celebration of Dizzy Gillespie, which we asked uh, John Faddis to lead. And um, but it, it, and John and I put the band together. John knew a lot of musicians from Chicago because he had worked and lived here, worked with the Chicago Jazz Ensemble for several years, but he didn't know Victor. And um, I have uh, worked with John long enough that when I would suggest a musician to him, he would trust my assessment. Yeah, Victor Garcia, you're missing the A. Um, but John had never heard Victor. And so I, I love this picture because the look on John's face is he's going, damn, he's great. And, Victor was playing his ass off. So um, I 
that's my appreciation of this picture, sort of knowing the inside story of John hearing somebody who's a stellar musician. Um, and John's ears are so finely tuned, particularly to trumpet players or flugelhorn. Um, so he was, this was the moment when he was realizing that this guy uh, was going to really go places. Here's a uh, very beautiful moment with Diane Reed. This was also at the Chicago Jazz Festival. And I love this picture also. It, to me, is so expressive of her energy and her whole personality. Um, as many vocalists do, they are able to communicate and tell stories, not only through the music, but through their body language. Um, Diane got off, I think, maybe two songs, possibly three, and then there was this huge downpour. And for those who don't know, the Chicago Jazz Festival takes place outdoors in Millennium Park. And... Um, and so after really having not very long to be able to capture pictures, um, the, the whole set got rained out and she wasn't able to go back on stage. Mm. Both of them are really hard to shoot. Um, I think it's not always easy to take, uh, to get an image that is flattering, where their mouth is not distorted or because they are really working all parts of their body to create their sound. And I think I, I often see images of vocalists that I feel are not very flattering or representative of, you know, what I think that they're yeah. trying to communicate. I think uh, um, Adriana had told me that as well in her experience with vocalists. Here's a very noir picture of a vocalist, <laughs> Sheila Jordan. This is from 1984, I think. Um, and the bassist was Harvey S. But um, people who know Sheila know that she's worked uh, for a long time uh, doing uh, duos with bass players. Um, and I think this was the first time I, I photographed her and, and met her and we began a relationship that has lasted uh, till now when she's in her 90s and still singing. I love this image. To me, to me it's really evocative of the sort of dark, um, you know, atmosphere of small jazz clubs, which is where this uh, concert took place. Um, and uh, it just kind of feels like a classic image to me. I, and just it, it, to say, relatively recently, within the last few years, uh, Sheila came to Chicago to play at the Green Mill, which is another small club where she often plays. And um, I noticed that the the proximity that she was in to, her, to the bass player um, in that moment was similar to this image, and I tried to recreate it, which. I was semi-successful at doing, but I'd never done that before. <laughs> it's kind of fun. Okay. And uh, now I want to share this moving photo of Vincent Cheney on the uh, French horn. Chancy, Vincent Chancy. Chancy, sorry. So I sent this to Ryer this morning. Um, because what I was talking about um, earlier was um, sort of discovering that there was a way to actually animate the pictures. In, in um, some programs, it'll play, it'll, uh, what do you call it? It'll play in a loop, it'll rewind so that you could just sort of watch it um, repeatedly. Yeah. But this gives you the general idea of this app um, has the ability to, um, I think, for me and the music pictures that I'm making, um, I can take them to the next level. And it's so gosh darn fun to do. <laughs> this must have been a constellation as well. 
Yeah, how could you tell? Uh, because I was dead. <laughs> <laughs> Ryer and I, um, I think, crossed paths myriad times without yeah. having met each other yet. Yeah. So this yeah. has been a nice uh, way to get to know you. Yeah. Okay, um, let's open up for any questions. What is the name well, of the app used to animate it? It's called Plotograph, P-L-O-T-O-G-R-A-P-H. And it comes in Android and Mac. I am um, an Android user, but the Mac um, is what was demonstrated to me by my friend. And the Mac version has a lot more um, than the Android uh, does. I recently, I'm, I'm, I have to confess, I'm not an Apple person, but I bought an iPad specifically so that I could download the, um, the Apple version of Plotograph, which I haven't done yet, um, but I'm excited about being able to experiment with a greater palette of different options on that app. I put the link to the software. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. There are lots of, there are, there are many, softwares out there that do the same thing. But my friend who turned me on to this is a filmmaker. And um, he looked at a lot of different ones. And this was the one that he liked the most and actually recently just released a movie in which he used um, this specific app to create a lot of the special effects in the movie. And yes, um, I think it was Howard had asked in the chat, um, if I choose the elements that I want to move? Is that what you were asking? Um, and yes, the answer is yes. That's exactly, you can choose the different elements that you want to move and you can choose the kind of movement that you want and how long you want it to last and how fast or how slow you want it to happen. So really John, hard. you had a question? Yes, uh, in your, uh, this is a little, I guess, technical like what you, but uh, in the earlier work where you were just discovering the technique of being able to add blur to the still images, uh, especially probably pr prior to digital, what was your success rate with that? It seems to me that I've done a lot of blur work and it seems to me that it's uh, uh, very hard to repeat and to get successful photographs. But, and the re re return is small. Yes, it, early on when I was doing that with film, it was extremely small. Um, so the digital, yeah, the tool of the digital camera, which I resisted for a very long time, um, really opened a whole new vast landscape of possibilities. I, I really, sometimes I have a, feel a little nostalgic about uh, not shooting with film. Uh, Chuck Fishman posted something the other day on Facebook, uh, which was, a, a, the image was of a, um, a film closet with strips of film drying in it. And you know, my response was I hadn't seen that or smelled that in over 20 years. <laughs> I realized that I actually had a, a feeling of nostalgia about the pungent odor of fix in my nose. Oh. <laughs> I think that some of the chemicals now are banned in several states, aren't they? I wouldn't be surprised and they probably should be. Yeah. You no. Know, um, on the other hand, I'm really glad that um, schools are still teaching uh, young photographers how to shoot and film because the thing that I feel about digital, I have a lot of negative uh, feelings about digital photography as well as um, feeling really great about the work that I've been able to do with it. But um, 
you know, working with film, you are limited by the amount of film that you have, those, you know, 36 exposures on however many rolls of film you have in your pocket make you have to be very judicious in what you choose to shoot or not. Whereas I think a lot of young digital photographers are just shooting at burst speeds and, you know, it, it has, I think, really sort of diluted um, the art of being able to recognize and choose the moment to, to press your shutter. I, I, I experienced the opposite. When, when I started to shoot digital, I realized that I was wasting a lot less frames because I, I could see what I was getting. And I knew when I got it, when I was after. Whereas I, it with film, you know, you, you think you've got it, but you don't really know until much later. So you keep shooting and shooting, or I would keep shooting and shooting and shooting to, to make sure that I, you know, that I got what I was after. But with digital, you know, you know at the time that you've got it. And, right. Um, that was the thing to me that was the revelation was that you could see what you were shooting. To me, it was like a musician being able to hear what they were playing. But I think that it's because you started in film that you are able to still continue to shoot judiciously. You know when you got it because you could see it, as you just said. And so and you the, don't need the, to... The one, one photo training that I had, one of the main exercises was to go out with a four by five camera and one sheet of film. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which yeah. is ten exposures, right? One sheet of film. One sheet of four by five. Okay. Well, one, I miss one. Oh, exposure. I see. Okay. I think no, I, miss the, I miss the magic of of film. I mean, I every house I ever lived in, I set up a dark room to the chagrin of probably my roommates, but I found a bathroom and. And I would develop my pictures like if I couldn't sleep two or three o'clock in the morning. It, it was a wonderful practice for me, a meditation. And I loved the magic in the dark room of a, of a picture coming up. Yes. That, that was that was the that's what I loved about photography. And like you, I was a very reluctant converter to digital. It took me a long time. And and my client said, Oh, thank God, he's finally switched. You know, but I didn't like, and so sitting in front of a computer and manipulating my photos that way yep. was not the thing for me. And so, um, and you know, I was a wire service photographer. That's what I started in and would would work in these funky dark rooms, you know, um, on scene. And I loved that. I think that was the kind of, you know, the aspect of photography that I really liked, which is missing to me now. Yeah. You know, people, and the fact that everybody and their cousin thinks that they're a professional photographer. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so because they have cameras better than me than I have. And and so I too, I have um I've taught and I love the fact that people are still, you know, shooting film and learning that part of it because I think that's really where you know, that's where I'm sorry that this that this career has changed a lot. I think that's where the craft of the art form it exists, you know, in, in learning all of those. <laughs> what, Mark? Existed. 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 Well, if, as Stuart said, um, film is still being taught in schools, I mean, that I think that is still the way that... Um, schools that are teaching photography are, be, are starting people out and and I think that's because it is that is learning the craft the craft of it um, I was so excited about making images when I first started and I, I went to a school at Columbia College in Chicago um, that I never really had the patience to learn um, how to print and so uh, as a freshman at Columbia College, I would, you know, I'd go in there, throw a piece of paper onto the enlarger, guess the exposure, throw it into the developer, pull it out when it looked like it was ready and, and plop it in the fix. I wasn't paying any attention to learning uh, how to do test strips. Um, I just wanted to see the image. Um, and I, I have, uh, it's funny since now I'm, you know, using technology, but I've always been kind of a technophobe. 
Um, at any rate, uh, I had uh, Bob Thal, who is a photographer, who some people on this call might know, was my teacher. And he saw the potential and the images that I was making enough to sort of drag me by the collar and teach me how to print. You know, he made me make test strips on every single contrast filter, bring it out to the light box in the front, analyze which test strip was uh, providing me with the correct exposure. And so I learned um, the craft and all of what learning the craft entails. And I think that, that you know, that that's also why it's important for um, schools and other teachers of photography to start people out there because it teaches attention, um, patience, uh, critical analysis skills, um, all of those sort of underlying things that we learn um, in developing this craft or learned as we came up in film photography are things that I think um, are the things that enable us to make good pictures, great pictures. Well, I don't know if this is boring to everybody, but I certainly have the nostalgia for the dark room and I, you know, I still have a dark room, but it hasn't been used in at least 20 years. But I'm, I'm afraid that I disagree just because I think that people are, um, when I was shooting film and I thought that, that people needed to have a darkroom experience to, to become uh, true photographers, uh, I felt very strongly about that. And mostly I realized it was because I felt that uh, people needed a way to finalize their images, to realize their images, to make prints, to, to work in the dark room and see if what they saw in the camera was what they were coming out with. And that they really needed to engage with their picture more than, you know, sending a, sending a roll of slide film off to Kodak and coming back, you know, a week later and, and you know, and looking at their pictures that they couldn't, couldn't do anything with. So I felt that very strongly uh, when, when that was the only option. But I also uh, uh, was initially fascinated by Polaroid photography. The first photographs that I made that really engaged me were with a Polaroid camera. And, uh, and I love that being able to see the picture right away. And somehow or other, I immediately realized that uh, I had to put it there to start with. Um, and I'm afraid that I think that this business of teaching young photographers, new photographers, darkroom is a big waste of time. I think that now people can, can finalize their images, they can realize their images, they can immediately see their images on the back of their camera, and then they can take them to their computer and they can, can perfect them in whatever way they want. And I think that much more emphasis has to be put on what do the pictures mean? How do you understand what people are saying in the photographic language? And I think it's perfect easy to do that it's better to do that with digital photography. It's faster. People get the feedback right away, and um, and they, they're not limited in in all the ways that film limited you. And so I think, you know, I'm I'm happy that people are shooting film, but to me, shooting film or or learning on film is like I don't know, you know, learn learning to do some kind of you know primitive painting or pr primitive primitive. Uh, um, um, you know, knitting or carving, carving linoleum blocks. Uh, it's a nice craft. It's fun to, you know, it's fun to, to play with the craft of it. But um, as far as making images and making images that mean something, I think people have to take the harder road of trying to understand what they're saying, how they're saying it, and what the options are when they make the picture, when they present the picture, when they process the picture, however they process it. I don't think you have to get your hands wet for this. Well, I, um, to, to shift the conversation a little bit, I'm just sort of curious about um, my work, my current work. Um, I, I, it, 
it's so different from conventional photography that people don't really know what to make of it. And um, I find that in the sort of fine arts world, uh, my work isn't really looked at as photography because it's not representational in that way, or it's not representational. And, um, in, and so I have a hard time sort of finding a place for it. I have a hard time finding um, at least in the sort of, you know, echelons of the fine art world or, or in other worlds that are relative to music that, um, and, and including the JJA, it, it's like my work doesn't look like other people's work. It doesn't uh, have a picture of a musician who is, uh, you know what I'm saying? I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't really know how to find a place for it. But it's but it's well accepted. You know, your 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 work is you know among the finalists in the JJA competition. It's it's widely exhibited. It's it's perfectly well accepted. I it I'm, it's published here and there and everywhere. Uh, so I I don't think you have to worry about that. I mean the the fine art world is a you know is is home to you know a pile of bullshit and your pictures are perfectly representational they're just representational of i mean they're not you know you're not just photographing light trails right you're, it's representational of the music yeah of the music and of of the music and mostly of the musicians mm -hmm. i mean occasionally you are just photographing light light trails but you're usually combining those light trails with a uh, uh a clear enough picture of the musician and and that seems very evocative to me and it seems very you know it very successful in representing your experience and like you say the musician's experience of the music so i i wouldn't say you're you know you're so far out of the mainstream i think the mainstream has moved to include you oh thank you for that perspective you know i I was a newspaper publisher for decades. And in newspapers, there's always been this mantra that you don't change anything at all. You, it's supposed to be truly representational. I mean, there's the famous case of the very famous photographer getting fired because he moved to Coke camp. I mean, that's, <laughs> I, th I actually thought that was pretty stupid, but, um, but as I, got out of newspaper and retired about seven years ago and got heavily into photography in lots of different ways, but mostly jazz photography. Um, I fell back on my mother, who was a creative artist, and she actually taught creative art at a university. And um, she had a mantra that um, a good artist doesn't represent what's in front of them they represent what they see, they hear, and what's in their heart. And that's kind of what you do. Yeah. And, and that's in, I love your stuff. It's awesome. I'm going to try and figure out how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, and and um... I will share that I have over the course of time developed some specific camera movements, Stephen, where mm -hmm. um, I might take camera and move it like this, or I might move it in a geometric shape. Um, I've experimented with, and all of those movement pictures are shot at one second slow shutter speed. Um, never any longer or any shorter than one second. I've just found that for me, that's the sweet spot. Mm -hmm. um, I have experimented with uh, shooting uh, slow shutter speed and moving the zoom from one end to the other. Um, sometimes, as I said, I'll just hold the camera up to my eye and move my body in whatever way the music is moving my body. So those are just a few of the specific techniques that I've developed. 
I find it interesting too that I'm beginning to see more and more people experiment with this, especially on the jazz photographer's site. Um, but I, it's clear to me that people who are just sort of put, di dipping their toe into it have a long way to go to be able to be predictive about what they're going to get. I have a question, a technical question. With your uh, technique, do, do the new LED lights have a serious impact on it? Yeah. I know you can, you can time it for, for the rest of regular photography, but how do you deal with that? Um, I just, I take whatever they're giving me, you know, in the same way that you do that with any kind of lighting. And so ex just experimenting with the slow shutter speed and seeing what's going to happen. Okay. Um, Howie posted the, what is the jazz photographer's site I was talking about is on Facebook. And that's the name of the page, jazz photographers. And it's international. Um, that's the thing I really like about it is it's very international. And I've met a lot of photographers from all over the world on that site and developed conversations and friendships. Um, I do have to also say about the digital world, um, being able to post images on Facebook and get getting instant reaction um, has been marvelous. You know, it's just ways of uh, sharing work and, re and being able to see that people are responding to it is very encouraging. Any other questions? Okay, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, this session was recorded for those of you who came late. Um, uh, we'll see you next month, August 20th with uh, Luciano Rossetti uh, from Italy. Um, and uh, thank you. Thanks thank you everybody. Much.